Hey. Hey, everybody. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the... the you the, want the, me to start? Is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, do, you do your singer. I'm going to do it. <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Blind Sense Podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Morris. This is episode five, right? <laughs> Did yeah, I, lose I believe it's five. All uh, this... we've, been, we've been away for a while. We've been attending a uh, gaming convention, so we have some special treats for you to, well, in the next few weeks, we probably have a few videos to show you. <laughs> Today, oh yeah, it's like trying to murder your friend. I'm, I'm editing videos, folks. We're actually going to have video this time. We're going to yes. have a really cool intro, but that uh, didn't happen so much because by the time we got back from the gaming fair, we were tired as hell. It <laughs> just didn't feel up to that. Beat is the word, yes. So we're going to talk about a couple of things that we saw there today, and then uh, later on, hopefully in a future podcast, we'll talk with our friends Doug and Rob, if they're available to speak to us, about uh, some of the other things that we saw at Origins Game Fair 2017. Uh, yep. But first, before we get going, I should probably warn you once again that this is a somewhat adult podcast, so sometimes we will use potty mouth words, and if that offends the you, F-ball. get away, run. <laughs> Uh, and now, I'll do my thing, the intro. experience every time I do the intro. Um, <laughs> so, obviously, a thing that we want to talk about, Mike, would be uh, the new system that we stumbled upon. Um, did you want to lead with that, or do you want to... How about we uh, tell everybody how we stumbled into it first, and then, okay. well, that'll tie into probably the next video anyways. Mm. Uh, basically, we're the, the first game we actually found at Origins. We were walking around, and you know, we just, it was, was, was that Thursday, I believe? Yeah, first Thursday. Yep. We're walking around, and it's like, we walk past this this, this area, and we see this guy just sitting there, like, wow, oh. he's got a bunch of stuff out in front of him. He's like, well, it doesn't look like he's to have anybody here. So we walk up and say, hey, what's this? Oh, it's a, it's a card game. It's a new art card game that's, you know, coming out of Gen Con. And it's called Adventuria. Uh, for any of you in the know, Adventuria is a setting based off another role-playing game called The Dark Eye. And this is the system we stumbled into that we seem to all love to that at the moment. So Yeah, so this this guy sitting there, also named Mike, oddly enough. Yes, um, good guy. <laughs> yeah, he was a cool guy. And like, I we, liked it. He was, he was really funny, really had a good sense of humor and everything. So well, we, to, we started to talking to him, and it's like, you know, we both at that stage don't know whether we're weirdos. So... Uh, <laughs> But, uh, we are. He, we are, but yeah. just in different ways. That's just all. in the good way, we hope. Um, yeah. Yeah. So he's uh, sitting there, and like, as we approach, I'm kind of like, okay, well, uh, card games ain't so much my thing. You know, I ain't no match. Me either. So I was like, hey, he said, oh, card game. I was like, <laughs> I ain't no match from Coffin. It's like, uh, so what's this game like? And the closest thing that he could give us was uh, magic. It's like, oh. Yeah, we're neither one of us are magic fans. Honestly, I had I had a bad experience at college, guys, and I just I don't want to think about it. <laughs> I'm not even that bad with magic. I just well, being blind now, it's hard for me to play anymore. But uh, but like here's here's one of my core things that I actually really like about the Adventuria system is that Magic the Gathering just completely loses me because I don't give a shit. I don't care. You have land, and you have mana, and I don't care. There's nothing with you to identify with, basically. Exactly. So as this, they've got decks where you've got your core iconic characters, 
and it's like this girl's a wizard this girl's an elf this guy's a dwarf this guy's a thief i can get behind that it's like okay i'll take the half elf thief because it's the closest thing to my you know sneaky bar i I believe wasn't he Hmm? wasn't he a straight elf uh no he was a half elf Oh, he was Check that. Yeah, he was, he's, he's, he's actually. So, if you guys go to uh, the Dark Eyes English-speaking website, because I'm assuming you're not transliterating us in German or Russian yet, uh, but those are available <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, Ulysses Spiel Dash US, I believe it is. Uh, yep. I will throw a link in that at the bottom as uh, yeah, of our podcast. Yeah, because I I can spell it now, but it took me a while. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, they've they've translated the German dark guy to English, and they've got a quick start guide which you can go through, and all the that iconics. Yep. Yeah, the iconics who are available in the Adventuria game are available in the Dark Eyes Quick Start, and there's a little blurb on Adventuria there, but they don't have a whole lot up until it's released at Gen Con. Until it's released, which, like I said, Gen Con, which I think is the. Either the last week of July or the first week of August. It's usually the first week of August, I believe. But, uh, yeah, we're waiting with bated breath to see what price it drops at. Um, We did get a hint, but we were told that we could not be told directly what price range it is in. So it suffices to say uh, way too low to somewhat reasonable but not crazy. (laughs) Yeah. Well, based on the Kickstarter, I'd say about sixty. But yeah, mm-hmm. and I'm perfectly willing to pay that price. That was by far my favorite game. I well, I mean, Mike couldn't really see it, but the cards also had exceptional art on them. So you know, right? Well, yeah. <laughs> All I know is I played the Battle Mage. That's yeah, mostly. But we did actually film a session of us, you know, a couple of me and my a couple of our friends playing the game together, and. Because it has dual modes. It has a, a dueling mode, which, you know, you, you fight your friends or whatever. And then you have an adventure mode where you, you go through an adventure and play the game. It's, I don't know. It's it's a very interesting game. I really enjoy it. Yep. So now one of the things that uh, while I was working on uh, editing, or rather more so than editing, just syncing and color correcting our, our like, nearly two-hour-long like, game. Fun stuff, yeah. <laughs> All the minutiae that nobody else cares about, but I'm obsessing over. Like, um, well, the parade was pretty loud that day, so yeah. So, a funny thing. Uh, I give a free plug out to to Audacity, the open source uh, audio recording software, which not only do I use to treat the audio from this podcast, but also. Uh, any video project that I'm working on. Yeah, I know. Adobe Audition or whatever. Nah, dude. Audacity may not have the the most stylized looking interface that you've ever seen, but the tools in it are incredible, particularly the noise reduction, because like you can get a swath of, this is the ambient noise I want to get rid of, and I did it on the us playing the card game and it was like it it was witchcraft witchcraft (laughs) like it's not completely clear but it like i could show you people before and after is it's amazing it's amazing it's quite a bit of difference yeah there was i was honestly surprised how well it turned out and then the rest of my headache was all uh, in you know, trying to sync up Syncing audio. stuff up, yeah. I need to... Well, we had multiple cameras going at the same time, so... I need to get rich so I can afford one of those time code syncing devices that wirelessly transmit to each device you're recording with. But as it stands, I just had to go by the clinks of the dice and that, because, like, I wasn't doing the, the clapper trick where you can sync up from that. And... Right. Hey. Hey. Pro tip to learn, as they say, or get richer. Yeah, pro tip to all you uh, aspiring uh, audio editors out there. What I've discovered through trial and error is if you want a perfect sync, uh, whenever you put the two audio tracks through, your scratch track, which is the junk one, and your your good audio track together, it should sound like the volume's louder if they're perfectly synced. If they're off by just a little bit, you get an echo effect. Ah, ah. 
Not that, not that anybody that really listens to this podcast is going to care that much, but if you ever, you know, now you know. That would drive me nuts, though. Being blind, I'd notice that pretty quickly. <laughs> uh, that's also why I mute all the uh, audio tracks that are not being used. But uh, it, it was maddening to get it dialed in just right. And uh, even more maddening where I'm like, are the lip movements right? I'm not sure. The scratch <laughs> audio is matched up. It must be right. Well, you would think. I don't know. Nah. So you have to do the, You have to tell me the lip thing. I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. She'll tell you the lip thing. What? Oh, uh, well, I didn't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> also, like, call her me a prude again, but one of the things that knocks me for a loop every time I look at her art is that the, the uh, warrior mage... Uh, girl that you were playing like she oh yeah she's got a tattoo around her navel and i'm like what is that about <laughs> wow mm-hmm. Ooh, that's interesting yeah some kind of uh not flowers but like a flowery ink design and I, I don't know if it means something from her um it might just be a stylistic choice or something it could just be as cool as i uh, one of the German authors goes, I want a girl with a tattoo. <laughs> and there it was. But, Could uh, be. I, I, I don't know. I kinda, I'm, with, I'm all good with it. It's, a, it's good. I enjoy playing the wizard. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. With one of the uh, characters, I remember, it was one of the gods, I believe, had that uh, the symbol, the classic serpent devouring its own tail deal. Um, uh, yes, one of, them was a, one of them has a serpent. I don't remember which one. So, so uh, I, I, I was thinking, quite possibly, it could have something to do with the wizard's uh, knowledge that she gained could, in the books. Oh, well, that might be. No, because I don't... Yeah, he might have been uh, a serpent guy, but I don't think so. No, I don't think it had anything to do with serpent, but I would imagine maybe it's some sort of, you know, symbol of power or something. I don't know. It could be. I honestly don't. I haven't come across it in the game yet, uh, being reading... So Absolutely, that, since like if, I don't pick it up, uh, but yeah. I if guess. we didn't mention it already, we got so freaking hooked on the card game, we both bought the D20 system now, so... Yeah. <laughs> I, I have a problem, folks. I spent way too much money. But yeah, hey, it's all good. They saw us coming. <laughs> I appreciate the fact that they, they come in PDFs now. I, a lot of them do, but it's still, you know... Mm. Back in the old days, I couldn't get a game when I first was blind, you know, in PDF form. You know, now I can read PDF. You know, that's great for me. I'm just saying to you, any game manufacturers out there, it's an untapped market us blind people. Yeah, especially if you're looking for something to pass your time, yeah. Well, it's that's why I like role playing and stuff because it's something I can still do. You know, I basically have to have a dice roller or something, but you know. You can still play roll, you know, pen and paper games. You just There's have to some. use a tablet or a computer or whatever that talks to you. That's basically your. That's the only barrier you really have. Yeah. And most people that are blind have that already anyway. So there's your own other untapped or market braille, right I mean, there. You can still do it in braille, I suppose. Yeah. There's your other untapped market right there. Is like uh, dice solutions for blind people. Because yep. um, one of the guys that we were talking to, uh, Crit Success, you guys can yes. find him at critsuccess.com, and we'll probably talk about him again with later uh, with Doug later. Yeah, very interesting um, things they had. Yeah, I got sized for these rings that they had where you can actually wear a spinnable D20 made of metal around your finger. Uh, they just spin it, it rolls. It's really neat. Damage counter. Yeah, it was virtually frictionless. It was really impressive. So uh, they're probably going to take what's left of my money after this convention. <laughs> I there's so much stuff I want to buy. But we we approached the guys working the booth and they were really cool. And there's like, hey, uh, do you mind if I take some photos of you? No, no problem. It's like, hey, uh, do you happen to have one of these rings with like? ridges or something that Mike could feel what number has rolled up. And they're like, no, we never thought of that. Let's pass hey, that along. Yeah, that's a good idea. I'll have to mention it to somebody. So, hey, maybe I just, maybe we changed some, some something out there. I don't know. 
who knows? But that's one of the other things that I wanted us to bring up about this uh, gaming fair slash convention is that the the attitude at Origins oh, yes. is way different from the garbage that we come from. It's like Paizo is the only other thing I can liken to having seen where it's like people actually want your feedback, you know? <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. And... and um, it's a very welcoming place, let's put it that way. Well, minor spoiler for the, the next podcast that we put out but, uh, where we can talk to Doug, but we all sat down to a game of uh, Dresden Files that this guy had made, Evil Hat Productions, if you're interested yep. in looking for that. Card game, actually. Yeah, yep. uh, board game with cards and all that that you lay out. And it was really well done. And he, yep. he really... Oh. He really put time into this that it's like they had a, a fate pool system that really kind of gave you, if I do this wrong, we're all screwed. <laughs> and yeah. Sort of like the same feeling you get in Dresden when you're reading the books. So. Absolutely what I thought, too. It's like it, yeah. it's like we could lose at any moment if things don't go exactly right. So Apparently it was just, it just ended its Kickstarter when we were there, I think. Mm -hmm. And they still had Kickstarter reward stuff left yeah. over. So if we bought the entire package, we got a lot of it. We got all the Kickstarter rewards, which was pretty awesome. Yeah. And then I got the the author and the artist to sign my copy of the game. Yeah. So that's that's the thing that uh, freaking drives me wild. We sat down with the guy who designed the game. Yep. <laughs> and he taught us how to play it. And I kind of guffawed whenever that happened, and I don't think he understood my reaction, because it's like, you got to understand, I'm coming from, like, Milton Bradley Monopoly world, where it's like some rich bastard who doesn't give a shit about you and will never talk to you designed this. Yep. <laughs> so the thought of the guy who made the game is going to sit down with you and teach you how to play it, it's a little alien to me. But it was... Because he, he, well, he knew exactly how to explain how to play the thing, too. That mm -hmm. was a great point. My favorite bit, which I probably will bring up again while we're talking to Doug, is how he had said, and because Harry Dresden can never catch a break, if your game ends in a tie, you still lose. Yeah. <laughs> which was pretty cool. Well, well and I mean... From, from what I understand, the game play is play, you play the, each scenario of the book out. Yeah, and that, uh, well, you, you have the uh, scenario from the books uh, that you can choose. I think there were like eight scenarios. I could be getting that number wrong. i got to have that up in front of me. Five. But, there was five in the original pack, and then there were, I think there's, I think it goes up to book 11, actually. Mm -hmm. But uh, it it could also yeah, be a... Was, there was three, uh, three bonus uh, booster packs. Each of those had two books in them. Yeah. And then there was the five from the original game. It, uh, so up to book 11. It also had like a random mode where you could, you know, put down a bunch of different things and, and deal yeah. with it. We didn't so much learn that yet because, like, we also, uh, as he had to see to other people who were sitting there, we talked to the guy's wife and she was saying that she had played the, the first book rules like eight times and it still was random enough that she wasn't sick of it. So, uh, another thing it's important for you folks at home to understand is that it's a co-op game as opposed to a competitive. So, you'll have, in a, a, a scenario like we had, you know, three of the main characters from the story. Um, yeah, because I played Dresden, you mm -hmm. played Murphy, right? Yep. And then I think Doug played Michael Carpenter, so. Yep. We had a nice mix. And uh, actually, some of the others that they had, you can get um, Susan, um, Rodriguez. Susan Rodriguez, and then you can get Billy and Georgia are a, a package deal. And then you can get, like, later on, they add in, you know, they add, add in, uh, shit, what's Dresden's brother's name? Oh, um, Thomas, yeah. Thomas, thank you. I don't know why I forget that. He's, my, he's my, one of my favorite characters. Uh, well, for some reason, then, Susan, I keep blanking on her name, and it's like, uh Susan, I remember, because, you know, I've read, well, I've read the first couple books more often, so I remember her a lot more. Mm. Um, and some of the Kickstarter stuff, like you, you get Half Vampire Susan, 
and then you could get Mouse, which that's that was the one I was most <laughs> interested in. Because I love me, I love me some Mouse. <laughs> but yeah, it was, that was a great game. I really enjoyed that one. Those those are my two favorite card games. I think that well, those are really the only two card games we really played, wasn't it? Uh yeah, most of the other stuff that we everything else was a board, board game or uh, role playing game. Yeah. yeah, straight pen and paper. I mean that one was yeah. weird because it was kind of a hybrid between being a board game and a yeah, card it was game. a little bit of each, but it was more card. Well, a lot of the, like a lot of your abilities and stuff you threw down was based on cards, mm. and then the board was basically where you set the adversaries and stuff that you had to take out with your cards. Really interesting. Since I really enjoyed the game. Well, it was the only game I bought at the convention, so there you go. <laughs> at the convention. <laughs> yeah, well, I came back and I bought everything else that, you know. Well, like I said, I need PDFs for the most part. But the card games I can usually play with somebody else or do whatever. So, like my brother said, he'd play with me. So, I one of these days I'll have to yank that out and see if we can play some. Because he's Red Dresden too, so... Okay. Now, one of the other things that I think we should hit on while we're we're not having Doug wait for us to talk about it is uh, the duel that you and I did at Adventuria. Oh where, yes, where you that were was the first thing we did was a duel. You were hitting you were the chin. Uh, you were the rogue. I was the wizard. Yeah. And I know what some of you might be thinking is like rogue versus wizard. It's like no. Weirdly enough. It was very balanced. Like, it could have gone either way. And that was impressive to me, that the card game was that balanced in a duel mode. So. And from what I've read through the RPG itself, it's pretty well balanced against each other that way, too. So, wizards aren't extremely powerful, say, as in Pathfinder. Yeah, well, I had a, a flash of, oh god, he's going to burn me from a distance, which... Kind of happened, I but not did, as bad I mean, as I won, I won the duel, but only by the skin of my teeth at the end, honestly. Yeah. If I wouldn't have, if I wouldn't have got that one healing spell at the last end, you would have, you might have beat me. Yeah, and I, uh, I don't think I got to draw on my healing potion, but I did. Uh, like it was a thing that at least then when we did the co-op you used, game, you later, used it once. Did I? Yeah, you're yeah, right. Used a healing potion yeah, once. you're right. It was towards the beginning, though, which is why I didn't quite. Yeah, you know, I didn't have my well, ace yeah, at the end. I, and I had that Bam Baladin spell, which is the healing spell for wizard. Mm -hmm. Actually, wizards can heal in the system, which is kind of cool. Um, but but the, oh. the the thing that you'll hear me complain to him about in the actual card game while we were learning the rules uh, for the uh, adventure co-op was. <laughs> The, how he was being a dick with his gin, because he, oh. yeah, he had figured out <laughs> he had figured out how to summon a gin, and its attacks were such a magical test as my rogue could not block them. So I had a chance of dodging his other attacks, but his but gin could just gin. wallop yeah. me. <laughs> to be fair, the gin only did a d6 of damage, but. Eh. This is when you're doing it every round, though. <laughs> like, well, that was halfway through the combat when I finally got the gin out. But yeah, yeah. gin is nice. Well, and see, that's one of the things that's interesting about the card game, too, is that you start out with a basic attack, and then you can draw weapons like a long sword. say, will improve your damage roll by probably a d6. Or, you or, being a rogue didn't have any magic at all. You yeah. Know, that was... I yeah, mean, so had... all I could do was a, I could pull a bow out on him, which I did, and I could uh, attack him. Stab me. Yeah. Yeah, because you could make, you could, with this game, you could make a one melee attack, one ranged attack, and one, you know, magic attack if you have one. And don't take it as gospel, but I think it was every character starts out with a D6 melee as a basic, and as you draw the different uh, cards. Six of some, like, I had a D6 magic. I had my yeah. Burninator, remember? Yeah. As I called the it. The Burninate spell, which... Yeah, which is just, I can throw a d6 of fire every, every round. That was my basic magic attack. And for those of uh, you who are but like... But I also, I could also attack with ranged weapons and melee. So I had actually... At, at the time I finally beat you, I was pulling four attacks around. 
because mm-hmm. my gin didn't count as an another att- a magical attack. Yeah, it was what they call a test in that system. So. Yeah, it was a magical test rather than a yeah. Which kind of kind, like I said, this the rules with the card game kind of translate into the RPG to a certain extent. Now it's not exact, you know, because you can't because it's a card game. But you know what I mean? It's yeah, very. Like, a lot of the spells do the same damage in the card game as they do actually in the RPG, which I thought was neat. Same with the weapons. The weapons all do the same amount of damage, too. Mm-hmm. And the, the most magic-y thing that I know is that, like you had to sacrifice certain cards to get uh, endurance, is what they call it, where you get actions, and then you can exhaust the endurance to perform those actions. So attacking, for example, is exhausting one card. Um, but right. like that, that was the, the worst thing I think for me to understand. Mm-hmm. Like, and now I picked that up pretty quick. Um, so that's, that's why I like the wizard. Cause I could get a lot of exhaust things out, you know, a lot of endurance out fast mm-hmm. because I was dropping like two and two cards out of my hand every round for the, you know, yeah. But a lot of that you'll do with cards that are things that you can't use because some will be better for adventure mode, some will be better for dual mode. Exactly. Um, and an issue that I had against Mike's characters, I had a card that I would have loved to use where you can just straight up steal the armor off of your opponent and use it yourself. Except I didn't have armor. <laughs> Freaking mage <laughs> armor was the best thing he had. So it's like I, I can't could actually cast the spell, but he couldn't steal the spell. Yeah, I can't steal mage armor stuff. off of you because it's not a physical thing. So uh-huh. yeah, you're broke. Well, because I played well, because I played that with you, but then I played another dual mode with Mike, and he 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 beat the crap out of me. Well, he was, I actually was about as close as you were to him, so. Yeah, well, and another I thing I'm going to point out, out, and it just he he was. I played a blessed one, which is the cleric version of the whatever in this system, and it's a great it's a great character, but it takes a while to get some of it. It seems to take longer to get some of your stuff out. Yeah, so no, that's the, the problem I had. The blessed one. I was just listening to the audio editing the uh, the main game again. Mm-hmm. And the Blessed One and one other one, I can't remember which one it was, are not in the core pack of uh, the Wild Runner. The, the Adventurian game. Wild Runner. Okay. I think it's an Elven Wild Runner. I think it's the one I, uh, Bob played. That sounds right. So I think you've got it there. But, um, I think. Because I, I think the main deck has the Rogue, the Wizard, the Dwarven Fighter Guy, Dwarven Warrior, I or Dwarven Mercenary, maybe? And then um, I don't remember what the, the fourth one would have been. See, I didn't get a really good close look at what the dwarf was in in his practice. I just remember that he could wallop them good. <laughs> oh, when he got his big stuff, yeah, because that's what that's what Mikey played. He, he walloped me. Because he was using a weapon that did 2d6, 2d6, like, plus 3. And he got that out pretty quick. But he, he still had a better weapon in his hand that he had not got off it, which was a th- it did 3d6 plus something. See, yeah, and, and Doug almost got that out in adventure mode, and he was salivating over it. It was like, oh, it takes so much endurance to pull it out. <laughs> it takes like six, I think, to pull it out. Yeah. Six or maybe nine, even. Well, I mean, with all the damage that thing does, yeah. <laughs> like, it had to have been a chain weapon. Because from what I can tell, like like giant flails and stuff seem to do are nasty in damage capacity. Either that or it was a giant two handed maul of some sort. I think that's what Mikey was using was a giant two handed hammer of some sort. Okay, without going too deeply into the text to try and see if I can get out an exact name, uh, in the quick start guide I can see that he is a forged dwarf is his culture. Yep. And he's just a warrior. Um, okay, he's a warrior. Yep. He is Arbosh, son of Angrax. He's a he's a nice character. Because I looked at I looked at him in the in the in the rules. 
couldn't remember, you know, it's been a while since I looked at that. Yeah, Hell, and, I read that uh, two weeks ago. Right but, underneath so. him in the the uh, PDF is uh, Mirabon Al or Hirma, and that's the wizard. The wizard that you were playing, yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was really cool that they did in the core book uh, was when you go down to character creation stuff and they give an example of her and they actually took the time they and used effort. They the names of characters. Yeah. They, As well, an example, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But they also they, they uh, got the artist to do her as like a child in like just a, you know, I don't know what the what the term is, well, the small clothes in, or like in, um, Oh, she, she's, she's just basically in the, t- like the type of clothing that you would wear when you're going to bed. Right. And she's like, just discovered her power. And it's like, ah, and then there's one of her as an adolescent where like, she's starting to study books. And then there's her as the young woman wizard that she is currently in the game where, you know, she's kind of coming into her own. And, like, that was a nice touch that is often overlooked, I think, is that the, they put a lot of emphasis in this D20 system about your character growing. Yep. Well, this well, like in the D20 system, it's a classless, skill-based system. And it's, with a D20, it's still D20, but you roll under your your the number you have to reach rather than over Lower numbers are better, basically. So D20s and six, and it uses D6s and D20s, and that's it. It's simplified in some ways, and it's a lot more complex than others. Now, another thing is uh, the Adventuria card game. If you go to Ulysses Spiel dash US again, guys, link below. Uh, there is only one downloadable so far for the Adventure card game, and it's. Uh, it's a what, mat, what it says, yeah, it's a mat that says hero document, and it's like several of those. So you have like the name of your character, body control, craft, knowledge, perception, persuade, stealth, survival, will, willpower, and reward cards that you picked up during your session. And it allows you to keep track of your start, raise, and current value for each thing. So even in within the confines of the card game. Like, you're going to be able to level up your characters. I just don't quite understand how yet, because we haven't seen it yet. We haven't got that far yet. Yeah. We, well, we played adventure mode, but we only played basically the first basic adventure. Mm-hmm. And that's what you'll see in the video that we have. Which, which was pretty solid, because as we discuss at the end of the video, like, there is an easy, medium, and a hard progression on that, where you can... If you're, like there might even be more than three versions. There might be even higher versions than that. More likely than not, but it's one of those things. Is like just just the existence of those three was an exciting prospect to me because it's like, okay, uh, your your players already understand this game pretty well, and they're starting to mow through the enemies. What do you do? You ramp it up to I, the next difficulty level. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they use the way they do experience levels in the RPG. They use the same names. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, and that's one of the things while we were talking with Mike there that like really turned us on to the card game system is that a lot of the core values of things were almost the same, if not just very similar to what's going on in the D20 system. Yep. Because we had straight up asked him, it was like, okay, well... Mike's really good at going through PDF documents and learning the D20 systems. Can he carry over his knowledge from the D20 to the card game? And to yeah, a certain extent, yeah. Apparently to a large extent you can. Like much okay. much more so than any of the other games that we were looking at for the whole freaking show. So <laughs> Well, like I said, it's basically the card game's a simplified, more simplified version of the RPG from what I can tell. Mm-hmm. And that's because you basically got to play. You, you can't build your own character. Yeah. At least not yet. Yeah. Who knows for the future? Well, and like one of the things I got so freaking addicted that's like, okay, well, I see there's a solo adventure. I'd like to purchase that for myself. So I purchased the PDF for Vampire of Havana. And uh, it actually, like, I have yet to go through it properly, but I did glance because I'm like, how are they going to do this? So you've got the option of playing 
a pre-gen rogue character who is a rogue without a name. He's not the iconic. Um, or you can just use one that you made yourself if you want to go through with a core book and, you know, do your thing. Right. So I wouldn't be surprised if the card game... I'm not saying they will. I'm not saying they have to. But I wouldn't be surprised if they gave you ways to customize the base card set in a similar fashion. Because, I mean, we're already talking about raising values here. As, to a certain extent, you're going to be able to tailor your character in the long run. Yeah, I would say so. I, like I said, we'll have to see. I'm, I'm going to buy it when it comes out, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> that's more money down the tubes. But that's... Uh-huh. And, and it's one of those things, like, it's, I really kind of want to see where this goes, so I'm going to throw my money at it. Like, um... <laughs> There's well, a there's a Kickstarter going on right now that we both jumped on to, so Well for the RPG, by the way. But yeah. Yes. Yeah, not for the card game, just for the RPG, but uh if I were a smart person I would have brought that up already and you know, also it's this one, but you know. It's, well, it's the War of Kingdoms. So wanna look that up? That's it's pretty good deals for the stuff you get. And they're already over 400% funded, so there's a lot of stretch yeah. goals. Now, yeah, if you couldn't hear perfectly over that small glitch Mike had in the audio while I brought up the page, it's the Warring Kingdoms uh, Dark Eye RPG. And for what, to me, is the low, low price of, of 40 bucks, you can basically get what looks to be the entire path <laughs> and then all the rewards for it. You only have four days to go, so it's going to be three days by the time I get this up. You better hurry. <laughs> uh, well, sometimes, sometimes they let you pledge afterwards, if it, you know. But I, either way, it's going to be if you can't, you'll be able to get all the stuff on uh, Drive Through RPG. That's where mm-hmm. they do their RPG PDFs. But if you want the the physical books, you go to Paizo.com. So you oh you Wesley you, you how do you say that you listen. <laughs> Ulysses, like the general, Spiel. Ulysses Spiel. Yeah. Yes, they also are the people that translate Pathfinder into German. So yes. there you go. I think right, even Russian, maybe, too. But uh, the the one guy um, who we were talking about, whether we could record the game or, or not, um, he gave me his email address. Eric. Yeah, Eric gave me his email address. It's It's like... Ulysses Spiel dot uh, de for Deutschland. It's like, yeah, this is German as all get out. <laughs> yeah, I think the I think the U.S. headquarters is in uh, Las Vegas, if I remember correctly. So it it was a bit of a gamble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> clever, no, <it's> clever. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> it's all good. Uh... Yeah, great game. Check it out. Yeah, and it's, like uh, the the forty dollars that I got in there saying it's going to be sixty eight dollars when it's out in the wild. So and that's not including the stretch goals, which yeah, so no brainer. I can tell there's at least four other PDFs in the stretch goal, plus three uh, twelve tracks of music. Uh, also, if you get the physical rewards. Uh, that's a little more expensive, but you get all the PDFs with that to go too. So there you go. You got if you guys like physical stuff, that's not a bad deal. Get your PDFs and your physical copies all, you know, mixed in. That's not bad at all. I'll tell you what. And like I would the good like thing it. Is all this stuff will be out by Gen Con. So in a month, it'll be shipped to you. Yeah. You don't even have to wait because it's basically it's just to turn around because you. They have to translate from German to English, so yeah. that's basically what takes so long. But it's it's better to have a product that needs translating as opposed to a product that doesn't even exist in any form for yet. Yeah, I that's almost any time I see anything, I don't bid on it because I'm tired. I get tired of waiting. Like I have a Kickstarter that was supposed to be fulfilled about a year ago and it's still not done. Dude. It's almost done, but it's not done yet. It's so got I was like one more adventure path. To it. I was just going through because it's been forever. Um, I need to play Strafe because I got that, and mm. those guys like 
yeah, that has nothing to do with anything blind oriented. But I'll tell you guys, like they spared no expense in bringing back cheesy 1996 GeoCity style websites. <laughs> like it was, I was to the point that I like, okay, I'm going to turn on the screen recorder on my computer so that I have this for posterity because like. <laughs> All the all the shitty website making the use here's Christmas colors for no reason <laughs> all that sort of thing like they nailed it they perfectly captured that era. <laughs> uh, what I can still see. <laughs> yeah, why? That, that's what made you go blind. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things. But uh, no, I'm still I'm still pledged on Shenmue three. I'm waiting for that. You know. Oh, that's still up. Please. Hey, he just came out and said he's got to do it. It's not surprising to me because the uh, the original story that he had conceptualized that he wrote out was supposed to be like 18 parts. Mm-hmm. So then the first game was part one. Wow. So then when they finally got the second game out, which I'm like... Uh, which system is it coming to? Which system is it coming to? It came out finally for Xbox. Um, original Xbox. And I'm like, okay, well, I am I grabbed that. And that's got parts 2, 3, 4, 5, maybe 6. It was like, I saw some interview that was that was done for some gaming magazine where they translate all the things that you, Suzuki was saying, and like he, the the simplest terms that he could put it in for the translators is like, idea was too big, hand motions needs to be small, <laughs> but like. Jeez. He was he was writing a, a what basically was an epic quest story of your stereotypical 1980s youth who loses his dad who's a martial artist and needs to go out and avenge him and learns a lot about life love and everything all along I've the way. Seen, I've seen that movie. <laughs> yeah, uh, quite a fucking few <laughs> At least times. Five times. <laughs> no, what's what's weird too to me is like I don't know if it was a, a thing of the translation. Or whether uh, it was just the way that it came out that this is just a, a, a normal quirk in Japanese, which seems to be the case, I'm pretty sure, from right. my experiences. Like, whenever they started the game, nobody wanted to talk about it. I was like, oh yeah, the day your dad died! <laughs> so, like, all the townspeople that you talk to is like that day that it snowed. <laughs> what? Yeah, so... <laughs> It was snowing whenever uh, his dad was attacked by Londi and killed. Uh, okay. So it's just kind of almost it's, like the Russian. It's, it's it's the secondhand reference. Yeah, there. also almost like that Russian understatement for it's like, oh, it was a brutal murder. It's like that was unfortunate. <laughs> like this is along those lines because it's like that day it snowed. It's like yeah, the day his dad was freaking murdered. Um, if I'm gonna, and again, I don't know like, proper in-Japan Japanese culture to know for sure, but, like, if there's something I'm going to knock the early game f- for, it was way too many people know who the hell who Ryo is, especially because, like, he goes from uh, the suburb to the main town to the, and, like, a bunch of people who it's like, who are you and why are you talking to me, you weirdo? <laughs> like, <laughs> know who he is. But, um... Yeah, I've gotten far too off track here on how much of a weeaboo I am yet again on this <laughs> podcast. It happens. <laughs> One last thing that I I will talk about though is the the interactivity in that game was amazing and taught me another valuable lesson whenever I tried to watch the DVD movie version of it on Xbox for a refresher. Like that almost made me not want to play the second game. Because it was so boring to sit through the whole thing. And that's a valuable lesson right there, boys and girls. Is that a good-to-play story that gives you all those sorts of freedoms. That you can do things like buy 
uh, capsules out of a capsule machine or go down to an arcade and play OutRun. Yes, original OutRun and Space Harrier. It's great to play, really boring to just sit there and watch somebody else doing it. <laughs> yeah. Sadly, that's all I have left. Well, <laughs> that's why I play role-playing games. Oh, maybe we should mention some of the other games we played without going into detail, because like I said... Mm -hmm. Uh, well, there's also Norse Foundry and Elderwood Academy, which I have cards for right here. Oh yeah, that too. Oh, we can we can oh we can talk about your wonderful dice tower that you bought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh man, I I paid so much for that thing. I don't know whether I want to give a, a free plug, but I'll tell you. So the the yeah, but it's a sweet ass dice tower. I'll give it, it is that. a sweet it's ass dice. Tower. That's why I bought it. That's why it's like, oh god, he's got me. I can't get away. Well, but, then you um, went crazy and bought me a set of dice. So come on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that that actually was manufactured by Elderwood Academy. Uh, you can find them at elderwoodacademy.com, Oddly enough, um, yep. the fine craftsmanship there also the norse foundry dice we got those from that same stand they had a kind of a duplex thing going on there yep uh you can nice find, dice you can find them at norsefoundry.com it's like i love those dice good polished stone dice and you know let's find an alligator jasper jasper yeah yeah, like, pretty green color. So Not that I can see it, but you know, green's my favorite color. So there you go. You can at least feel the stone in your hand, or they had metal ones too. Like it's nice and heavy. Yeah, I I kept commenting to him every time we went back to that stand like three times, <laughs> and yeah. every single time it's like, dude, you have such good craftsmanship here. Like, oh, it was beautiful stuff. And, oh, even the. Like, the case I bought was sweet, too. If not, putting every other stand there to shame, coming close, so... It was... Yeah, it was worth what you paid for compared... I mean, there was a lot of really nice stuff there, but that was by far, I think, the best stuff I... Quality-wise, just... It was just beautiful stuff. There was the one stand that we went to, um... Uh, if I, I'll bring up the picture if I can of uh, Doug handing you the great hammer uh, out, oh, made out of wood. Big, yeah. They had just as nice a dice at about oh, the same yeah. price, and at the time, um, Norse Foundry had uh, sold out of uh, everything but the display of the the uh, dice that I was interested in the color of, so mm -hmm. they wouldn't give me a discount. And I'm like, eh, I'll just buy it online instead of something other people have been fingering all day. <laughs> but we went to that other stand and there was this weird uh, kind of like uh, silver and lime green inset color of dice. And like, oh, yeah, yeah. I have sometimes a weird taste for color and I'm like, that's just odd enough. I'm going to buy that one instead because, you know. Yeah, doesn't that work mean Doug got the those four sets of whatever, too? Wasn't that the same place? Or am I thinking was... No, I think it was the same place. You gotta give me more to go on than four sets of whatever. It's where Doug was four talking. Four sets of dice. Remember when yeah. we the four sets of dice? Oh, yes, yes. That, they, was that the same place? That I was the deal was. they were having there, yes. Those are pretty nice dice, too. Still got two sets of purple ones, though. Oh, well. <laughs> I know my nice my nieces really appreciate the dice because they played with them more than I have so far. Mm -hmm. So I, to the point where I had to put them up before they started losing them. Uh, there was another thing that we came across now. Uh, have Lost Battalion Games, LBG, uh, lostbattaliongames.com. Now, was they, that one? I don't remember that one. We didn't really go to that one. I just kept coming back to it because they had some kind of... Uh, I think more Civil War oriented games. Oh, that that but, was that place. But one of the subdivisions that they had there, this guy had these really nice tiles. I'm talking like photorealistic, oh, ridiculously that, that nice. The, yeah, and like you could write on the tiles with erasable marker, things like that. Like it was really nice, and I'm like, oh man, I think it was like twenty bucks for a roll. And, like, they had a beach and a forest and, you know, things like that. 
I'm like, I have no practical reason to run, want this right now. But I do but, anyway. But it looks really good, so I'm going to take your card. <laughs> yeah, they did the map tiles. Uh, that, well, that's also something else that we can talk about, but we'd probably want to get Doug's feedback on is uh, the Conan game. Uh, uh, yes, great game. Too bad the Kickstarter died. So disappointing. Yeah. Have, well, that's why I put Adventuria is going to be the one that comes out first, as opposed to that yeah. Conan game. Because we were going. We actually did film. It was called Conan: Rise of Monsters. It was a great little minis game. The miniatures were beautiful. The system worked really well, and it was just fun to play. Mm-hmm. And I'm kind of set with. And it was kickstarted. Um, I can't remember how much he wanted originally, but he had the funding. It was. It was only like six days later and he canceled it. I yeah. Don't so the and that is the most maddening thing to me because it's like I understand they had uh, somewhere around three hundred sixty three eighty somewhere in that neighborhood backers backers, but they wanted I like think a, it was over three hundred thousand. It was like three times funded. Yeah, but they, they wanted a thousand backers, and, and it's like, oh well, we only have the interest of this small number of people. You have the money to make the thing, make the thing, and then once you've made the thing, then worry about drumming. Because like, okay, they ran a Kickstarter first time. I think that one straight up didn't get successfully funded. If I remember correctly. Right. Um, I have it bookmarked here. So that was a couple, 2015, I think that one was. Yeah. So they ran that one. Because uh, they actually partnered with Yudoshi U- Spiel. Yeah. And they were, they were going to help them do it. And they, I, it's, I don't understand. I, well, it's another thing that's disappointing because, I mean, like here... First place we stumbled on didn't maybe have the best uh, vantage point of the rest of the con, which was to benefit us that they were in such right. a good place in the game fair. Um, like has two of the games that we like the most. So because yep. he was right next to Ulysses Spiel guys, the the yep, Aventuria. The, the tables were right next to each other. Yeah, and so. the and the one on the other side was the dark guy that we're playing. Okay, so Conan Rise of Monsters, uh, Pulposaurus Entertainment, uh, was canceled on August 10th, the original one. Um, oh, last year or the year before that? That was the first one, so I'm trying to see where the date... It just says August 10th up there in the corner. Oh, maybe it was last year then. I think so. Um, and then you've got the relaunch... Which was canceled, and the official number there, they were 368 backers. They had uh, 1,000, or excuse me, 100,000. Uh, I'm going to slow down so I can speak correctly. They had $108,760, or $706. So, that again, if I can ever speak correctly, is 108000 and seven hundred six dollars, three hundred sixty-eight backers. They wanted to have forty thousand dollars. You freaking did time and a half. <sighs> At least time and a half. And no, uh, and their and a half. their official update. Uh, let's click on that. So they're moving on. Thanks. Thank you for your patience. Check the main page for the the update. Um, and then they're answering other people's questions like, why don't you do it anyway? Uh, well, we just didn't have enough people. Um, but the thing is, you know, wasn't that thing open only open for like a week? Uh, so I think it started at like the 6th. Let me take a look here. And the convention was the 14th, so it was like only like a week or 10 days, and he canceled it. Or two weeks into the Kickstarter, he canceled it. Yeah, so it was launched on June 13th. It was canceled on June 21st. Yeah. 
It started the day before the convention, and he canceled it the day after the convention. So the other one was launched July 31st, 2015, and went until... It, August something, wasn't it? And it went till August 10th. And then they announced the relaunch on the main page of that one. At that time, they actually had more backers. They had 595. Um, they had a much larger goal at that point, where they had uh, 250,000. They only raised uh, 101, 422,000. Or, yeah, 101,422 dollars, rather. Um, so they actually raised more this time than last time in yes, less time. But still not enough. With less backers. Like... I don't know. And the thing is, it's always at the end when everybody rushes to, to back things. Yeah. I, at least in the, a lot of the experience I've seen. I now, don't it's not always know. that way, but always at the end there's a big surge. I don't know if things might have happened that were completely unaware of, like maybe Reaper, Probably. It's, Reaper's it's, miniatures told him that, like, it's, you know, you need more money than this to go into production, any number of things, but... You should have had that worked out beforehand, though. It, it just, to me, again, we said before we started this podcast, we're, the, these guys clearly love their games, and we don't want to say anything ill of them, especially when they don't mean to do ill. But I just don't understand why I can't. I don't understand. Thing. I also think that it just... You needed more patience. You needed to let the Kickstarter run out and run its course. And well, yeah, like I said, he had it open for a week. Uh, I mean, I think... The only uh, thing... If it got towards the end and it was still only 100 yeah. and some thousand? Okay, maybe. But it's still funded. The only thing that makes sense to me is that there are some sort of extenuating circumstances... Yeah, that's what I'm thinking too, but I... Uh, it's just sad, because we really like the game. That's basically our problem. We so, really uh, like yeah. the game. So it's the, what do you do now? Uh, so yeah. the the best solution uh, we had found on Drive-Thru RPG, they had put it up a sample that's free uh, for however it's long... Almost that, everything. That remains there. Now, it's, not, it's basically the same thing as the playtest we played, so it is... Uh, the whatever hard to say name of of who basically was James Earl Jones's character in the first Conan movie. Uh, uh something. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not even. Thousand gonna... Thousand Doom. Thousand Doom. Oh. Well, actually, well, I got, um, let's not be dumb. I've got the Kickstarter page up here. Let's take a look at what uh, it is. Toth Amon. Toth Amon. Thousand Doom. I think was the. The, his uh, uh, country or whatever. Mm. But worshippers of Set, so he had a big set against a big uh, Oliphant. I mean, like, it was solid. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to happen. So the best thing I could suggest to everyone is should they happen to have it on drive through RPG, you grab what you can and uh, page over to somebody like uh, Reaper's Miniatures, who they were going to partner with in the first place, and you see how similar of a figure you can find, and quite possibly... Then just use those, yeah. Yeah, you do yourself a little old homebrew. Yep. That would be our suggestion, and that's probably when we might actually try to do something like Because like I said, we like that game. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that they said they didn't want to stand in the place of a, a bigger publisher who might be able to accomplish it. But at right. the same point in time, like, just go for it. Go for broke. You got to do yeah. that uh, that Dark Knight Rises thing where Batman's, like, taking that jump. You know, Bruce Wayne's trying to do it. And he's like, you can't do it with the safety cord. It's got to be all or nothing. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. I feel sorry for the guy. Because, uh, like I said, I like the game. Mm. The guy was pretty nice, too. I just, uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I he was, he was uh, one of the designers. One of the designers, a team of three. So, you know. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, like, I'll keep a lookout for those guys and see some of the other stuff that they've done. Uh, but that's uh, just so disappointing. Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, well. <laughs> yeah, such as it is. So, yeah, talked about your gin, talked about the Kickstarter. Yeah. Um, we can go more in Dark Eye later on once we know what the hell we're doing. Yeah, once we get, I think, once we do our unveiling of the Warring Kingdoms would be a good thing, too. Mm. We can talk more about that later. Uh, actually, I think we should talk about, after we play the first time, what we think about it, Every maybe get everybody's reaction out of that. Because so far, what I've heard from the people that's looked at it, which are one of our other players that plays with his name is Eric, uh, he really seemed to love the system, too. So it's just this... This system takes a lot longer to build characters in, so yeah, There's boy, how so many choices. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm. Mike was up first. He and uh, our other other player, like it was K, it was we were trying to figure it out. <laughs> I just kind of let them puzzle it out while I'm the peanut gallery over there in the corner. I was working on uh, digitizing the the sheet into a. Uh, uh, Excel style document that I could edit later on, and oh man, is the choice daunting! But yes, they do have in the quick. Well, there's so much like at a beginning level character, you have so many choices. Like Pathfinder, you get one feat and a you know few skill points. This one's like, <sighs> well, like I was pointing out to the other guy who games with us, Rob, who you know is in the video with us. Uh, Freaking, there, there's the Quick Start Guide and the uh, Solo Adventure. Both will provide you with uh, some stats for characters to give you an idea of how they work. Uh, I mean, even the, the core book gives you some outlines. It's like, these are some characters uh, and how they work and why you chose these advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, they went through and about. showed you like a, a total walkthrough of how these three people three people built their characters kind of thing but it, and they you know break down the choices they make and what's cost and blah 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 but i'm a guy who was so uh, lazy with trying to figure out pathfinder that like up until recently i had to get help building a character and even still uh i mean like i will forget to add certain things in when we hit certain levels so like Kay and Mike have got to go back and... Well, you're more <laughs> obsessed about the interaction rather than the stats. Yeah. So. But, dude, I know how to get my bluff score where I want it. <laughs> Put that aside. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> like, you, you forget to add your constitution bonus and stuff like mm -hmm. that along. Why do I have so little hit points? Uh... Did you remember to add your constitution you for, to add your constitution for the level? past three levels? Nope. <laughs> oh, I forgot to add all my human points in. <laughs> it's like I'm going to throw some numbers at you. You tell me how off these are. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> it's just like, why is your attack bonus so low? It has to be higher than that. Oh, I forgot to add it in the last four or five levels. Well, That's see, one of, the, one of the problems was that I wasn't reading what went into which attack bonus, and it always dicked with me. Well, you me. probably modified your base attack, but then didn't modify your, you know, the rest. Yes. That's what I think you did. Exactly. Which is part of the problem, because it's like, okay, well, this weapon, uh, you know, always... Always for the characters I'm building, do I take uh, weapon finesse because, yeah, uh, not a strength builder. And uh, I don't usually either, unless I'm playing a fighter type. Yeah, because there's I much rather have it in Dex and Charisma, so there you have it. Um, yeah, I'm usually the opposite. I well, not always, but sometimes. But uh, yeah, I like. As we've discussed before on this podcast, my method of playing characters is that if I can talk you out of us fighting, things are going as they should. If I'm going to begin something with combat that's not some sort of grift, something's going wrong. <laughs> yeah. Like I said, you're usually the party base, so... <laughs> I'm the type of player who uh, tries to do, like... Uh, here's another obscure reference for you folks. Uh, Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome, where the, 
That's the, not that obscure. <laughs> the pig killer guy goes, Wait! Wherever you go, there you are. Oh, yeah. The guy he's fighting, he's like, what did you just say? (laughs) Still a good movie. Oh, also, quick insert uh, here for William T. Thrasher was the dude who handed me his card, who was uh, with us uh, whenever we were playing that Conan Rise of Monsters game. Oh, that was that? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, and uh, he helped me set up. He had to leave. He had a thing, but he does live-action roleplay, promotes special events, and uh, does some game design. Now, we kind of stayed away from the LARPing, so I, you know. But he's with Kettle of Fish Productions, so if any of you people happen to be into LARPing, you know. Uh, Check and it I, out. Yeah, and he I need... He was a really nice guy. I need to stop saying you people, because <laughs> that sounds like a derogatory <laughs> Well, we were just saying, <laughs> any, of, any of our audience is what you, we should say. You folks over, over there, in that their direction. <laughs> yeah, because we at the convention, we did meet one person that was not friendly, or at least, you know, I, at least I don't recall anybody. Well, there was Jamie. <laughs> well. <laughs> Making fun of uh, Rob's friend Jamie, which uh, who, pro- who probably will not even listen to this podcast, but oh, then sure Rob... Probably. But Rob will turn and, and tell him. It's like, there, there's one of the stories that we're saving for next time is playing Flux with Jamie and get Doug's opinion on that. <laughs> I have quite unfavorable opinion of that game right now. It's like, oh, the Batman version, anyway, folks, because I know we were discussing with Eric how they're probably not all made to the same they're all, level. They're all based on whatever genre they're actually taking the game from, so yeah. Yeah. They have different rules and expectations for each of them, from what I understand. They still work in a general sort of way, but they try to get the same flavor of... If you're playing Batman, they try to give you the Batman flavor. If you're playing... What was the other one? What was the one he was talking about? I don't even remember. I don't know. All I know is that uh, Rob said that they'd gotten a different version and I gave him an unfavorable response to that, which I will explain <laughs> next time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll refrain from that until we, have a better, until we have more people to laugh at it. But yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> I still laugh at it, but I don't think about it. But it's, uh, it's not for little children's ears. <laughs> None of this is for small children's ears. Pretty much. Not that any of us are listening to us are small children. Unless my nieces are going out. <laughs> Who knows? This would be the time caps. So what did Uncle Mikey record back in the day? Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> he was a horrible man. Never know. Uh, you know, Joker said it best with, uh, we stopped checking under our bed when we realized the monsters were inside us. <laughs> no, that's a good point, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm full of, well, I get all kinds of monsters and demons running through my head. It's all good, though. I don't let them out for everybody else to play with, so it's all right. Most of the time, anyways. That's all that comes out when I'm the DM. <laughs> Even I'm not really that much of a sicko DM, but yeah. At least I don't think I have. Excuse me. That yawn came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. It is late around here, folks, because. We tend to do things at night when it's quiet and we don't have interruptions. Yeah, like small children that we had yesterday when we were going to record the podcast. It's like, yes, my uh, nieces happen to be here. They all, always seem to show up when I'm doing something online. I all understand. three of them. <laughs> it's, it's interesting to be Skyping with Mike whenever that happens. Because it's like, I can always tell when he's getting irritated. It's like, no, quit crawling on me. <laughs> Well, and the thing is, they were like, they were like crawling all over me, and I'm like, I'm trying to move. I couldn't even move because okay. they were crawling. But you know what the one thing that was going on there was, was the whole, it's like, I want to watch tunes. It's like watching in Uncle John's room. It's like, well, Uncle John doesn't give her attention if she she asks him to watch tunes. So. Well, I would have put them on if I wasn't talking to you guys. I just, mm. you know what I mean? Because I don't mind if I'm not. Well, I'm pretty sure that... If there are more parents than just uh, Doug and Rob listening to us, they know that any time you're on the phone, <laughs> d- no, will be in your no, ear. 
me now. It's like, but I'm on the phone. You didn't want to talk to me before I was on the phone. You can wait until I get off the phone. To be fair, we were on freaking Skype for like nine or twelve hours. Or something kind of crap. We were trying to so, figure out all the options for Dark Eye, but you know. Oh yeah. <clears throat> but it's I'm like it's like when they're here normally, I usually, you know, cater to their every whim for the most part. That's how that's why I'm the favorite uncle most of the time, you know what I mean? <laughs> Because I don't even mind. I don't even mind watching cartoons. I just don't want to do it when I'm trying to do something else. And then you know, and that's that's just kids for you, though. Kids are inconvenient because they want to do things on their own time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we probably should wrap it up. Yeah, this is probably a good place. Okay, so folks, once again, we do not get paid promotions around here. If you would like to send us unmarked bills in the mail, though. Let me know, and we'll get you we'll an address. Take those for sure, yes. uh, but we again want to uh, give shout outs to some of the things we mentioned here. Crit Success for their fabulous uh, dice rolling rings. Yes, uh, those are awesome. The Warring Kingdoms uh, Kickstarter, Kickstarter, which is going right now for Dark Eye RPG. Uh, link in the description below for those things, as well as Ulysses Spiel US. Which you'll find a link below for two, where you can find the Dark Eye core game, and eventually, when it comes out at Gen Con, Adventuria card game. Well, anyways, folks, I think that'll be all for us tonight. So until next time, which will probably be sooner than we anticipated, keep it nerdy. The theme music used for this podcast, Orc March by Snowflake, featuring Wolf Sebastian and Spinning Merkaba, is available from CC Mixter under the Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. You can find it at dig.ccmixter.org or find a direct link to it and its license information in our Blind Sense podcast descriptions. You can also give us something more to talk about next time or talk with Mike about your best wizard build by emailing valantrix at gmail.com. That's valantrix, spelled V-A-L-A-N-T-R-I-X.